mind that Thomas does think that Oswald killed Tippett, but that's not really um, uh, an, uh, relevant to the other good information that he pulls together. It's just his conclusion based on the evidence that he's he's talking about. And I think that's mainly a lot of what all we, what we all do is we kind of have our interpretations of what's presented, whether it's from original documents or from what other people have presented, and then we are our own personal opinions, and that's a, that's a positive thing rather than a negative. Okay, so um, there's a section that particularly intrigued me, and I think the key thing to think about is the theory that there was either more than one Oswald or imposters. So I'll, I'll I'll go into this and start. So it's the Mexican restaurant, which specifically is this one. Um, when Lee Harvey Oswald was apprehended, he had $13.70 on his purse. One might therefore deduce that Oswald did not have an escape plan. After all, how far was he going to get on $13 and change? It wasn't as if he couldn't get his hands on additional money. Along with his wedding band, he'd left $170 cash in his wife's dresser. Alternatively, if Oswald was part of a conspiracy, then there was almost certainly an escape plan and he must have been expecting help. Thus, the Warren Commission made it a point to insist, quote, Investigation has produced no evidence that Oswald had pre-arranged plans for means to leave Dallas after the assassination, or that any other person was to have provided him assistance in hiding or in departing the city. But the evidence was right under their noses. After leaving the book depository, Oswald took a taxi cab to Oak Cliff. The driver of the cab, William Whaley, produced a manifest which showed a pickup of a passenger in front of the bus terminal at about 12.30, which he unloaded at 500 North Beckley. Whaley testified, quote, I asked him where he wanted to go. He said 500 North Beckley. Well, I started up. I started to that address, and the police cars, the sirens were going, running crisscrossing everywhere, just a big uproar in that end of town, and I said, what the hell? I wonder what the hell is the uproar? And he never said anything. So I figured he's one of these people that don't like to talk. So I never said any more to him. But when I got pretty close to the 500 block, um, Natchez and North Beckley, which is the 500 block, he said, this will do fine. And I pulled over the curb right there. In point of fact, Natchez does not intersect North Beckley. Whaley had actually dropped Oswald at the corner of Neely and North Beckley, one block shy of the 500 block, and the three blocks beyond his boarding house. At, at 500 North Beckley, the intersection of 8th and North Beckley, there was a Mexican restaurant, one of a chain called El Chico. Oh. Was Oswald to meet someone there, or just hungry for nachos? <laughs> Perhaps apprehensive about what awaited him in the restaurant, Oswald scurried back to his boarding house to get his pistol. It was while briefly in this hidden room that the police car pulled up in front and honked its horn, according to the housekeeper. Was Tippett and his partner provided security for Oswald's escape? By honking the horn, were they prodding him along? Leaving his boarding house, Oswald retraced his steps and returned to the court corner of 8th and North Beckley. But instead of entering the Mexican restaurant, Oswald turned east and headed into the neighbourhood. Three short blocks later, at 10th and Pan, Tippett, Tippett brought him about at gunpoint. So it was Tippett trying to retrieve Oswald and force him back to the rendezvous. So that's the issue where Thomas is, is his belief that Oswald did shoot Tippett. And where was Oswald headed? Jack Ruby's apartment was only two blocks away in the direction Oswald was headed at the intersection of Ewing and the I-35 <coughs> freeway. But it is known that Ruby had gone to Parkland Hospital. It, it, I'll, I'll come back over, that, we'll come back to that in a minute. That is, I believe it's in the second book. So that gives you an idea, um, like a, a, in a simple way, of Oswald leaving the cab here, it, it's star. There, the restaurant there, we've got the Texas Theatre here, the murder here, Ruby's apartment here, um, Oswald's bar in the house here. So it gives you, well, I know quite a few people here who've been, I haven't yet, unfortunately, but I want to go. So it is at least as likely that Oswald was headed to the home of one George Salazar two blocks further on the other side of the uh, freeway at 3128 Harlandale. That address appears in an investigative report by Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walters. About 8 a.m. this morning, while in the presence of Alan Sweat, I talked to Sorrells, the head of the Dallas Secret Service. I advised him 
that for the past few months in a house at 3128 Harlandale, some Cubans had been having meetings on weekends and were possibly connected with the Freedom for Cuba party, of which Oswald was a member. Um, he said then says on the following day, uh, quote, I don't know what action the Secret Service has taken, but I learned today that sometime between seven days before the President was shot and the day after he was shot, these Cubans moved from this house. My informant stated that Subject Oswald had been to this house before. The Cubans meeting at the Salazar home were members of a violent anti-Castro group called Alpha 66. It was precisely this collect, uh, connection that led the HSCA to criticise the CIA, information regarding its assassination plots that it withheld from the Warren Commission. The critical clue was an incident that occurred shortly thereafter at the Mexican restaurant. That is a more recent photograph. That one is around the, the time in the 60s. I don't know if it's yeah. right in 1965. <laughs> and then that one is um, recent. It was the next appearance of the station wagon. So, as in the station wagon that... Um, I've been seeing that uh, Craig saw in Dilly Plaza. Behind the El Chico was Mac Pitt's garage, so that's at the, the very back on the right hand side. A mechanic named T.F. White reported the incident to the FBI. White noticed a car parked behind the restaurant with two individuals lingering nearby. The mechanic explained that his suspicions were aroused in part by the fact that emergency vehicles were racing through the neighbourhood with their sirens blaring, suggesting that the police were searching for someone. There was something surreptitious in their behaviour, such that White put down his tools and walked across the street to get a closer look. On his approach, however, the men jumped in their car and sped away, headed west on 8th Street. One of the men, according to White, who claims to have gotten a good look at his face, looked just like the man that he later saw on television accused of shooting President Kennedy. It turns out that White was not just a mechanic, he was a reserve police officer. Not only had he seen a suspicious person who looked like Oswald, as had Deputy Craig, he had taken down the licence plate number, Texas plate PP4537. On the 13th of December 1963, FBI agent Charles T. Brown, with a visit to the Dallas County Tax Office, identified the car with PP4537 as a 1957 Plymouth registered to a Carl Amos Mather of 4309 Colgate Avenue in Garland, Texas. When the agents got to the Mather house on Colgate Avenue, the car with the plate PP4537 was parked in the driveway. The car was the family station wagon, a two-tone white overfaded blue in colour. Mather's wife then told the FBI that not only were her husband and Tippett very close friends, but that Carl had left work early on the day of the assassination to go to Tippett's house. Carl Mather worked at Collins Radio in Richardson, Texas. This information is particularly disturbing because Collins Radio was a front for the CIA. This was revealed when a ship leased by Collins Radio was used in Operation Amtrunk, a raid by CIA trained anti-Castro anti exiles on Cuba. Among these were some of the same Alpha 66 Cubans meeting at the Harlandale address in Dallas. Oswald's landlady, Mrs Mary Bledsoe, testified to the Warren Commission that on at least two occasions Oswald told her that he was trying to get a job at college radio. So, when I read that, it reminded me of reading James Douglas's book, James uh, Kenyon Unspeakable. Um, at the time, I thought it was the best book in terms of explaining why Kennedy was killed. Oh, is it there was, right? Yes, the political yeah. atmosphere and why. I thought that the very end of the book was the weakest part where he sort of digressed from that and started getting into really, really wild conspiracy theories. But that was when I read that in like 2009-10. This was like repeating it, or some of it, and although I thought at the time that was the weakest section, because somebody else had looked at it and obviously felt the same thing, that kind of got me on a uh, looking into a bit more detail. So I want to read a little bit of this bit as well, but bear in mind what I said earlier about the imposters, there's a bit of a, a lead into it first, which is regarding the Texas theatre. Now, bottom left on here, you can see it, and I think this is the better, mm. more detailed um, map, which again shows you how squashed together all these places are. Which book is that from Paul, that map? 
This one I'm not sure about because it's that long ago since I saved the fort, or six <laughs> years ago when I originally started. But when I started doing fingerprints of intelligence, this is what kicked it off. And I intended to do that as the first presentation. I thought, well, why do that? Let's just do all, do, do all the intelligence connections. And then six years later, it, it, it's got to it. So I'm not 100% sure I can find out. So you've got the, again, it's more detailed. You've got Oswald, where he left the cab, where his rooming house is. You've got the top, the Gokko gas station, which I've got in the photograph of as well, uh, where obviously Tippett was waiting for somebody to come across the viaduct. Um, you've got the Texas Theater in the bottom left hand corner, and then you've also got top 10 records, which it doesn't show on that map, but that is down there in that corner as well. You've got the uh, place where Tippett was killed in the middle. You've also got um, another area which I'll come to in a minute. You've got the Kathy Coleman um, apartment as well, which has different connotations. Just to sort of give you the logistics, Daly Plaza is the top right of that map that you just can't see it. You've then got the river and the viaduct over it, so you can see the path that the... And his room is about the top north of Ewing as well. Bottom right, yeah. Bottom right. Yeah, there's a better map in a minute. Right. Just one point about that. Yep. Example. Um, I've always wondered why, if you look at that map, the other one showed it in a little bit more detail. Yes. Oswald's resident, 1026 North Beckley. Um, mm. If he actually came from there, and some people doubt that he actually went to 1026 after the no. assassination, but if he did, if he was going to the Texas theatre to meet his CIA contact, which is what they did, they went to the local theatre to, if something went yeah. wrong, yeah. why didn't he go straight down yeah, the exactly. river? Why did he deviate off to 10th and Patton? Because yeah, he's probably got rubies. I've got a that's, fabulous other... defector story that will back that up. Well, I, I'm suspicious of the whole idea that he did kill Tippett. And yeah, I, didn't well, I don't think Tippett. many of us in here think that. But Sorry? I don't think many of us think he killed Tippett. No, no, no. So he wasn't ever at He couldn't have gotten there anywhere in time if he didn't yeah. kill Tippett. He could have, actually, because I think if well, you look at the right. timing... Well, the timing, not, she not says... Not the official story. Yeah, though. but that, the official... If you look at the... As I have the document, she said that um, she had the telephone call from her friend and turn the TV on to hear about the Kennedy death. So actually, it might not have been one o'clock because it was. Be it could have been ten to one. Yeah. It's possible. Mm. I'll go, but this, in terms of, if we're saying he couldn't have got there in time, maybe somebody who looked like him could have done, and that's yeah, what's sure. related to this bit. So, uh, so uh, Butch Burroughs, who witnessed Oswald's arrest, we've got the photo of the arrest. <coughs> There's this, uh, there. Um, Butch Burroughs, who witnessed Oswald's arrest, startled me in his interview. So this is this is his interview with um, Douglas. Um, by saying he saw a second arrest occur in the Texas Theatre only three or four minutes later. He said the Dallas police then arrested, quote, an Oswald lookalike. Burroughs said the man looked like, almost like Oswald, like he was his brother or something. When I questioned the comparison by asking, could you see the second man as well as you could see Oswald? He said, yes, I could see both of them. They looked alike. After the officers half-carried and half-dragged Oswald to the police car in front of the theatre, within a space of three or four minutes, Burroughs saw the uh, second Oswald placed under arrest and handcuffed. The Oswald lookalike, however, was taken by police not out the front door, but out the back of the theatre. What happened next we can learn from another neglected witness, Bernard Hare. Bernard Hare was the owner of Bernie's Hobby Horse, just two doors east of the Texas theatre. Hare went outside his, house, his store when he saw the police cars congregating in front of the theatre. When he couldn't see what was happening because of the crowd, he went back through his store into the alley out back. It too was full of police cars, but there were fewer spectators. Hare walked up the alley. When he stepped outside the front door of the theatre, he witnessed what he would think for decades was the arrest of Oswald. Quote, police brought a young white man out, Hare told him the viewer. The man was dressed in a pullover shirt and slacks. He seemed to be flushed as if he'd been in a struggle. Police put the man in a police car and drove off. When Hare was told in 1987 that Oswald had been brought at the front of the theatre by police, he was shocked. I don't know who I saw arrested, he said in bewilderment. Burroughs and Hare are com complimentary witnesses. From their perspectives, both inside and outside of the Texas theatre, they saw an Oswald double arrested and turned to a police car in the back alley only minutes after the arrest of Oswald. Burroughs and Hare's independent, converging testimonies provide critical insight into the mechanics of the plot. 
In a comprehensive intelligence scenario for Kennedy's and Tippett's murders, the plan culminated in Oswald's Friday arrest and Sunday murder, probably a fallback from his being set up to be killed in the Texas theater by the police. There is a hint of the second Oswald's arrest in the Dallas police records. According to the uh, Dallas Police Department's official homicide report on Tippett, quote, suspect was later arrested in the balcony of the Texas theater at 231 West Jefferson. Class Oswald, mm -hmm. the uh, altercation with McDonald, was on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, Dallas Police De Detective L.D. Stringfellow also reported to Captain W.P. Ganaway, Oswald was arrested in the balcony of the Texas Theatre. To whom are the homicide report and Detective Stringfellow referring? Oswald was arrest arrested in the orchestra, not the balcony. Are these documents referring to the Dallas Police Department's second arrest at the Texas Theatre that afternoon? Was Butch Burroughs witnessing an arrest of the Oswald lookalike that actually began at the balcony? That would have likely been the double's hiding place after he ended the theatre without pain, thereby drawing attention to himself and leading the police to the apprehension of his likeness, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was already inside. As Burroughs pointed out, anyone coming in the front of the theatre could head immediately up the stairs to the balcony without being seen from the concession stand. The Oswald double after having been put in the police car in the alley, must have been driven a short distance and released in higher intelligence orders. Speculation there. Yeah. Unfortunately for the plot, as he was seen again soon, with the scapegoat Oswald now safely in custody, we can presume that the double was not supposed to be seen again in Dallas, or anywhere else. Had he not been seen, the CIA's double Oswald strategy in an Oak Cliff shell game might have eluded independent investigators forever. But thanks to other key witnesses who have emerged, we have now now have detailed evidence that the double was seen again, not just once, but twice. At 2 p.m., as Oswald sat handcuffed in the back seat of a patrol car, boxed in by police officers on his way to jail, Oswald knew what final role had been chosen for him in the assassination scenario. That night, being led through police headquarters, he would shout out to the press, I'm just a patsy. Also, though, at about 2 p.m., a man identified Oswald identified as Oswald, was seen in a car eight blocks away from the Texas theatre, still very much at large and keeping a low profile. The sharp-eyed auto mechanic spotted him. T.F. White was a 60-year-old long-time employee of Mac Pitt's garage in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. While White worked in the automobile the afternoon of the assassination, he could hear police sirens screaming up and down Davis Street only a block away. He also heard radio reports describing a suspect, then thought to be in Oak Cliff. The mechanic looked out the open doors of the garage, he watched as a red 1961 Falcon drove into the parking lot of the El Chico restaurant across the street. The Falcon parked in an odd position after going a few feet into the lot. The driver remained seated in the car. White said later, the man in the car appeared to be hiding. White kept his eye on the man in the Falcon. When Mac Pate returned from his lunch uh, a few minutes later, White pointed out to his boss the oddly parked Falcon with its, wa uh, its waiting driver who seemed to be hiding. Pate told White, to watch the car carefully, reminding him of early news reports they had heard about a possible assassination attempt against President Kennedy in Houston the day before, involving a Red Falcon. White walked across the street to investigate. He halted about 10 or 15 yards in the car. He could see the driver was wearing a white t-shirt. The man turned toward White and looked at him full face. White stared back at him. Not wanting to provoke a possible assassin, White began a retreat to the garage. However, he paused, took a scrap of paper from his overalls pocket and wrote down the Texas <coughs> plate of the car, PP4537. That night, while T.F. White was watching television with his wife, he recognised the Dallas Police Department's prisoner, Lee Harvey Oswald, as the man he had seen in the Red Falcon in El Chico's parking lot. White was unfazed by what he did not yet know, that at the same time he had seen one Oswald sitting freely in the Falcon, the other Oswald was sitting handcuffed in the Dallas Police car on his way to jail. <coughs> Mrs. White, fearing the encompassing arms of a conspiracy, talked her husband out of reporting his information to the authorities. Thus, the Oswald sign in the parking lot might have escaped history, but for the fact White was confronted by an alert reporter. On December the 4th, 1963, Wes Wise, a Dallas newscaster who specialty was sports, gave a luncheon talk to the Oak Cliff Exchange Club at El Chico's restaurant. At the urging of his listeners, he changed his topic from sports to the president's assassination, which Wise had covered. He described to his luncheon audience how he, as a reporter, had become a part of Jack Ruby's story. Wise's encounter with the man he knew as a news groupie came on the grassy knoll the day before Ruby shot Oswald. Wise had just completed a sombre day after the assassination radio newscast on the site blank, banked with reeds. While he sat in his car in silent reflection beside the book depository, he heard a familiar voice call out, Hey Wes! 
As Wise told the story, I turned to see the partly figure of a man in a dark suit, half waddling, half trotting, as he came toward me. He was wearing a fedora-style hat, which would later become familiar and famous. Jack Ruby was making his way along the grassy north in the direction of the railroad tracks. Perhaps precisely where the day before, as Ed Hoffman watched, another man in a suit had fired a rifle at the President. An hour and a half after, Julianne Mercer saw a man dropped off by Jack Ruby carrying a rifle at the same site. Ruby leaned into Wise's car window and said, his voice breaking with tears in his eyes, I just hope they don't make Jackie come to Dallas for the trial. That would be terrible for that little lady. In retrospect, Wise wondered if Ruby was trying to set him up for a radio interview to go on record the day before with his famous motive for murdering Oswald. Although Wise had no interest then in interviewing Jack Ruby, he had already just been told enough for him to be called as a witness at Ruby's trial. He would be subpoenaed as a Ruby witness by both the prosecution and the defence. His testimony at the trial, quoting what Ruby said to him the day before Ruby murdered Oswald, would then be cited in Life magazine. At the end of Wise's talk to his absorbed audience at the Oak Cliff Exchange Club, Mac Pate, who had walked across the street from his garage to listen, gave the used caster a new lead. He told Wise about his mechanic having seen Oswald. Wise asked to go immediately with Pate to speak with his employee. As Wise told me in an interview four decades later, he then put a little selling job on Mr White to reveal what he'd seen. Wise said to the Rookton Auto Mechanic, well, you know, we're talking about the assassination of the President of the United States here. Convinced of his duty, White took Wise into El Chico's parking lot and walked him step by step through his full face encounter with Oswald. Wise realised the car had been parked at the centre of Oswald's activity in Oak Cliff that afternoon. Uh, one block from where Oswald got out of the taxi, six blocks south of his rooming house, eight blocks north of his arrest at the Texas Theatre, and only five blocks from Tippett's murder on a route in between. Taking notes on his luncheon invitation, Wise said, I just wish you had gotten the licence number. White reached into his pocket and took out a scrap of paper with writing on it. He handed it to Wise. This is it, he said. Newscaster Wes Wise notified the FBI of White's identification of Oswald in the car parked in the El Chico lot and cited the licence plate number. FBI agent Charles T. Brown Jr. reported from an interview with Milton Love, uh, Dallas County Tax Office, 1963 Texas licence plate PP45373 uh, 4537 was issued for a 1957 Plymouth automobile in position of Carl Amos Mather, 4309 Garland Street, Texas. Uh, Colgate Street, Garland, Texas. Agent Brown then drove to that address. He reported that the 1957 Plymouth bearing license plate PP4537 was parked in the driveway of Mather's home in Garland, a suburb of Dallas. Thus it was the question of how license plate for Carl Mather's Plymouth came to be seen on the balcony in El Chico's parking lot with a man in it who looked like Oswald. The FBI had also discovered that Carl Amos Mather did high security communications work for Collins Radio, a major contractor with the Central Intelligence Agency. Three weeks before Kennedy's assassination, Collins Radio had been identified on the front page of the New York Times as having just deployed a CIA radar ship on an espionage and sabotage mission in, against Cuba. Collins also held a government contract for installing communication towers in Vietnam. In 1971, Collins Radio would merge with another giant military contractor, Rockwell International. In November 1963, Collins was at the heart of the CIA military contracting business for state-of-the-art communication systems. Carl Mather had represented Collins at Andrews Air Force Base by putting special electronics equipment into Vice President Lyndon Johnson's Air Force II plane. Given the authority of his CIA-linked security clearance, Carl Mather refused to speak to the FBI. The FBI instead questions his wife, Barbara Mather, who stunned them. Her husband, she said, was a good friend of J.D. Tippett. In fact, the Mathers were such close friends of Tippett and his wife that when J.D. was murdered, Marie Tippett phoned them. According to his wife, Carl Mather left work that afternoon at 3.30 and returned home. Carl and Barbara Mather then drove to the Tippett home where they consoled Marie Tippett on the death of her husband killed by a man identical to the one seen a few minutes later, five blocks away, in a car, bearing the Mather's license plate number. <coughs> Fifteen years after the assassination, Carl Mather did finally consent to an interview for the first time with the House Select Committee on Assassinations, but on condition that he be granted immunity from prosecution. The electronic specialist could not explain how his car's license number could have been seen on the Falcon with its Oswald-like driver in the El Chico lot. The HSCA dismissed the incident as, quote, the wise allegation. 
in which a confused auto mechanic had jotted down a coincidentally connected license plate as alleged by a reporter. The odds against White having come up with the exact license plate of a CIA connected friend of J.D. Tippett were too astronomical for comment and were given none. What kept the Wise allegation from sinking in total oblivion over the years was the persistent conscience of Wes Wise, who in 1971 was elected mayor of Dallas. During his two terms as mayor, 1971 to 76, Wise guided Dallas out from under the cloud of the assassination at the same time as saved the Texas School Book Depository from imminent destruction and preserving it for further research into the president's murder. In the fall of 2005, I interviewed Wes Wise, who recalled vividly T.F. White's description of his confrontation with a man looking like Oswald in the El Chico parking lot. Wise said he was so struck by the incident, he returned to the El Chico lot on a November 22nd afternoon, years later, to reenact the scene with similar lighting and a friend sitting in an identically parked car, standing on the spot where White had <coughs> with the same degree of afternoon sunlight. <coughs> Wise confirmed that one could easily recognise a driver's features from the full face. Look at that distance, irrespective of whether the car's window was up or down. The possible significance of what he had learned stayed with Wise during his years as a reporter and as Dallas Mayor, in spite of its repeated dismissal by federal agencies. Knowing the value of evidence, Mayor Wise preserved not only the Texas School Book Depository but also the December 4, 1963 luncheon invitation in which he had immediately written down T.F. White's identification of the license plate on the Oswald car. Producing it from his files during our interview, Wise read to me over the phone T.F. White's exact identification of the license plate as the auto mechanic had shown it to the reporter on the scrap of paper taken from his overalls pocket, and as Wise had then copied it down on his engine interview, it was indeed PP4537. At the end of our conversation, Mayor Wise reflected for a moment on the question posed by Lee Harvey Oswald's presence elsewhere at the same time as T.F. White saw him in El Chico's parking lot, in a car whose license <coughs> plate could now be traced, thanks to the scrupulous note-taking of White and Wise, to the employee of a major CIA contractor. Well, he said, you're aware of the idea of two Oswalds, I guess. Um, so, um, Douglas then goes on to talk about the Robert Vinson story in Area 51, which I don't really subscribe to. <laughs> However, the Collins Radio stuff seemed worthy of more research, and this is where I was in 2013, which I then backtracked and went all the way back to the very start, partly what Gene's already talked about. Um, so, in researching it, and repeating that research more recently, it goes to show again, is what always surprises me about the Kennedy assassination, assassination, is how much information there is in plain sight. If you do a Google search for Collins Radio, the top link is the Wikipedia page for Rockwell Collins. Click it and the link states, Rockwell Collins was a multinational company headquartered in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, provide, uh, provided avionics and information technology systems and services to government agencies and airfare, aircraft manufacturers. The company was acquired by United Technologies Corporation on November 27, 2018, <coughs> and now operates as part of Collins Aerospace. You scroll down, and the very next paragraph under the heading History says, quote, Arthur A. Collins founded Collins Radio Company in 1933 in Cedar Rapids. It designed and produced both shortwave radio equipment and equipment for the Virgin um, AM broadcast industry. Collins was solicited by the military, the scientific community, and by the larger AM radio stations for special equipment. Collins supplied the equipment to establish a communication link with the South Pole expedition of Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd in 1933. Byrd? Yeah. Yeah, B Y L D. Yeah. Wikipedia states that, quote, Rear Admiral Byrd was an American naval officer and explorer. He was a recipient of the Medal of Honor, the highest honor for valor given by the United States, and was a pioneering, avi a pioneering aviator, polar explorer, and organizer of polar logistics. Byrd. I said to myself, that sounds familiar. I'm thinking it can't be that easy, can it? Well, it is that easy. Search for Texas School Book Depository, and it confirms that it was purchased on July the 4th, 1939, by D. Howell Bird. What does his Wikipedia page say? Quote, David Howell Dry Hall Bird was a noted Texas producer of petroleum and co-founder of the Civil Air Patrol. Bird's cousin, polar explorer Richard E. Bird, named Antarctica's Howell Bird Mountains for him. So you've got Collins Radio, Civil Air Patrol, the Book Depository, Art Big Oil, of course that leads to the military industrial complex, Ferry, Oswald and a whole lot more. 
So, Collins Radio specifically. The best, research, the best research I've found online is by Bill Kelly, who's contacted Pete because of it being today being advertised. And I am going to contact him after today. The only way I can do it justice is to read you an extract of an updated version of a presentation he gave at the 1994 COPA conference. So, this is verbatim from Bill Kelly. The significance of the Collins radio connections becomes apparent with a quick review of the published record. On November the 1st, 1963, the New York Times published a photograph of the ship Rex, which Fidel Castro identified as the boat that dropped off a team of assassins in Cuba a few nights previous. The Rex was docked at Palm Beach, Florida, near the JFK family compound, and the Rex Halloween Eve mission was in clear violation of Kennedy's March 1963 edict that no paramilitary raids against Cuba were to originate from US shores. According to the article in the New York Times, the Rex had been sold by the Samosa regime in Nicaragua to the Belcher Oil Company. Its dock fees, paid by the CIA front company Seaship Inc., with the Rex, then being leased to the Collins Radio Company in Richardson, Texas, for quote scientific research. Collins Radio became a major defence contractor during World War II, and following the war, participated in Operation Paperclip, hiring uh, Dr. Alex Lipish the former Nazi scientist who developed the Delta I glider and M163 Comet jet fighter. The Collins, Lipsich, was assigned to the boat development program that worked with General Dynamics in attempting to build and refine a sleek, swift speedboat, the V-20, that could be used for Cuban infiltration missions like the Rex mission. It was later used in Vietnam. David Ferry's telephone records reflect that in the weeks before the assassination he made frequent calls from the New Orleans law office of G. Ray Gill to the Belcher Oil Company of Dallas, Texas, the company that was listed as the owner of Rex. <coughs> in the week before the assassination, a reservation was made at Jack Ruby's Carousel Club for a large party of Collins Radio employees. The Dallas Police Department Intelligence Division maintained a paid informant who worked at Collins Radio and reported on fellow employees who appeared suspicious or subversive, including one who was reported to subscribe to the, lex uh, to the leftist IF Stone Weekly. When Lee Harvey Oswald returned to Texas from Soviet Russia, George de Morinschild introduced him to retired Navy Admiral Chester Bruton, an executive at Collins Radio, with the idea of Oswald getting a job there as he had worked in a radio factory in Minsk. Oswald and Marina visited Bruton with de Morinschild. At the time of the assassination, Admiral Bruton was working on a top-secret nuclear submarine communications project for Collins, with the Navy's nuclear sub-radar and communications HQ being based at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, close neighbours of Michael Payne's family island. In 1963, Collins Radio began receiving large military contracts, including one for the construction of a microwave communications network in Southeast Asia, specifically Vietnam. And this is the kicker, which I, 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 it's probably my favourite thing across the whole mm. subject. After Oswald was murdered while in Dallas police custody by Jack Ruby, his widow, Marina Oswald, married Collins employee Kenneth Porter. Um, Collins Radio supplied and maintained the equipment used by the Voice of America, all manned NASA space flights, the Strategic Air Command, as well as all equipment used for the CIA's Guatemalan and Cuban operations. Most significantly, Collins Radio was responsible for installing and maintaining all radio equipment aboard Air Force One, Air Force Two, and the Cabinet plane. According to the Collins Radio annual report to stockholders for 1963-64, Collins Radio not only installed and maintained the radios aboard most military and executive branch planes, they also operated the station known as Liberty at their Cedar Rapids, Iowa headquarters which served as a relay station for all radio communications between the White House, the Pentagon, Air Force One, Air Force Two, the Cabinet Plane, and Andrews Air Force Base in Washington. This Liberty station is misidentified on most transcripts of the edited version of the radio transmissions from Air Force One on November 22nd, 63. Air Force One, the presidential airplane, was placed in service in 1962 using communications equipment developed and manufactured by Collins. The aircraft was modified to meet special requirements in 1962. The station many remember as Liberty was opened and operated from the new communications building in Iowa. 
Collins had a contract with the Air Force to serve as either the primary communication station or as a backup whenever Air Force One and other aircraft in the fleet carried cabinet members or high-ranking military officials. Over the, over the airwaves, the station's call, world, call word was Liberty. In his book, The Making of a President, 1964, Theodore White wrote, There is a tape recorded in the archives of the government which best recaptures the sound of the hours as it waited for leadership. It is a recording of all the conversations in the air monitored by the Signal Corps' Midwestern Centre, Liberty, between Air Force One in Dallas, the cabinet plane over the Pacific, and the Joint Chiefs Communications Centre in Washington. On the flight, the party learned that there was no conspiracy, learned the identity of Oswald and his arrest, and the President's mind quickly turned to the duties of consoling the stricken and guiding the quick. According to the analysis of Martin Schotts and Vincent Salandria, Quote, yet the White House had informed President Johnson and the other occupants of Air Force One, all of them witnesses to the hill of bullets which had poured down on Dealey Plaza, that as of the afternoon of the assassination, there was to be no conspiracy and that Oswald was to be the lone assassin. <coughs> if White's report was correct, this would mean that the federal officials in Washington were marrying the government to the cover-up of Oswald as the lone assassin virtually instantaneously. This could have occurred only if these federal authorities had had foreknowledge that the evidence would implicate Oswald and that he would have no confederates. An innocent government could not have reacted in such a fashion internally. Unfortunately, there's no longer a tape recording in the archives of the government, as the original unedited multiple tape recordings of the Air Force One radio transmissions cannot be located despite an act of Congress, the request of the Assassinations Records Review Board and numerous Freedom of Information Act requests. The government seems to have simply lost the recordings, with no records being kept of their whereabouts or destruction, if in fact they were destroyed. The final report of the ARRB notes, White House Communications Agency was and is responsible for maintaining both secure and unsecured telephone, radio and telex communications between the President and the Government of the United States. Most of the personnel that constitute this elite agency are US military communications specialists, Many in 1963 were from the Army Signal Corps. On November 22nd, uh, the White House Communications Agency was responsible for communications between and among Air Force One and Two, the White House Situation Room, the Mobile White House, and with the Secret Service in the Mobile <coughs> The review board sought to locate any audio recordings of voice communications to or from Air Force One on the day of the assassination, including communications between Air Force One and Andrews Air Force Base during the return flight from Dallas to Washington. As many people are now aware, in the 70s, the LBJ Presidential Library released edited audio cassettes of the unsecured or open voice conversations with Air Force One, Andrews, the White House Situation Room, the Cabinet Aircraft carrying the Secretary of State and other officials uh, on November 22nd. The LBJ Library version of these, tape, of these tapes consists of about 110 minutes of voice transmissions, but the tapes are edited and condensed, so the review board staff saw access to unedited, uncondensed versions. Since the edited versions of the tapes contain considerable talk about both the forthcoming <coughs> autopsy of the President, as well as the reaction of a government in crisis, the tapes are of considerable interest to assassination researchers and historians. Given that the LBJ Library released the tapes in the 70s, the paper trail is now sketching quite cold. The LBJ Library staff is fairly confident that the tapes originated with the White House Communications Agency. The library staff told the review board staff that it received the tapes from the White House as part of the original shipment of President Johnson's papers in 1968 and 1969. According to the LBJ library's documentation, the accession cards reads White, uh, White House, I'm uh, sorry, WHCA question mark and is dated 1975. The review board staff could not locate any records indicating who performed the editing or when or where. The review board's repeated written and oral inquiries of the White House Communications Agency did not bear any fruit. The WHCA could not produce any records that eliminated the provenance of the edited tapes. Um, at the time Kelly delivered his report on the Collins Radio Connections to the National Corporate Conference in Washington in October 1994, the Washington Post had just then exposed the true occupant of a new mammoth suburban Virginia building. It was not the headquarters for Collins Radio at Rockwell International, as had been previously reported. But they had just seen the cooperating cover company for the super-secret National Reconnaissance Office, just as Collins Radio had served as a cover for the CIA in the operation of the Rex in Cuba in 1963. Um, and then 
the, the last, well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll read it on a bit. Also in October 1998, issue of John F. Kennedy Jr.'s George magazine, David Wise reported on how the NRO had lost six billion in US taxpayer money and specifically mentioned the fiasco surrounding the construction of the HQ building or of which Collins Rockwell served as a cover company. Arthur Collins was actually in Dallas at the trademark waiting for the president when he was killed. As director of the Research Center of the Southwest, a conglomerate of Texas defense contractors and local colleagues, colleges and university engineering departments, Collins Research Center was to be honored at the trademark and it's literally mentioned in the first paragraph of JFK's undelivered speech. The batch of records released in 2017 under the JFK Act include a number of new records that were declared not believed relevant by the ARRB, but are indeed relevant as they detail the close co collaboration among the Texas defense contractors, not only in the establishment of the research center in the Southwest, but also in overseas operations with the CIA and National Security Agency. So it's all a coincidence, basically. <laughs> um, <coughs> there's the gas station, and that, there's a much bigger version of that map. I think when I originally saved it, it was it's from either Poznan book or at least somebody that believed that, or believes that Oswald was the lone assassin. That version I've got from Armstrong, John mm -hmm. Armstrong's website. It's a, it's a smaller, um, the original's much bigger. But it's an actual photograph, as you can see, and it's more, it gives you more of an idea of the various places that we've seen already in the earlier photographs. Mm -hmm. You can see the route, where Tippett's murdered, where he's out of the taxi, the theatre's down here. And just when you compare that to give you an idea of the earlier... I'm wondering whether that map is from uh, Into the Nightmare. This one? Or the, no. The, yes, the, yes, I think it might be. That might be the... Yeah, because I've only got that I on e-book. Yes. familiar. Yeah. <coughs> so... Mm. There, you, there you have it. Is, the other one from Myers? Is it from Dale Myers, the other one? It could, one of them could be from Myers. Um, as I said, I started it so long ago, my notes aren't the best, so I'm not quite sure. Um, they're all on an old drive that I managed to dig out. But regardless, I, they're, mm. they're accurate, whatever the person's who's created its belief is. It just gives people an idea of how small mm. this area is and all of these individual <coughs> instances you've got Jack Ruby's apartment in the bottom right hand corner you've got where Tippett's waiting at the gas station for somebody coming over the viaduct you've got Oswald's rooming house you've got where he got out of the car you've got El Chico where this incident's happened you've got the Texas Theatre where Oswald or more than one I was arrested. You've got the, um, just off top 10 record, you can actually see it there. I knew it was one of them. Here. And then right in the middle is where Tippett's killed. Isn't that a state that Harry Olsen was guarding? That's on that man. Yes, it, it probably is, yes. <coughs> a bit further towards our own thoughts, I think. Yeah. So, <coughs> I don't know. <laughs> to uh, sums it up a lot throw to take, more, a lot to uh, take in and throw more stuff in all that soup. Um, Bart uh, we've uh, done an interview with somebody on and put it on face on the DP UK Facebook uh, page just last week, not long ago. <laughs> I don't know when he did the interview, um, but the guy that he was talking to was was uh, exposing all the lies uh, and, and the falsities uh, of, of framing Oswald and uh, the the bus journey blocked that uh, daily. Plaza with the with the traffic jam taking him back towards the with Mary Bledsoe and her testimony is all completely false. Mm. 
and the bus ticket stuff is um, so he was pointing at uh, Craig's Oswald running down <coughs> the knoll into the uh, in the car and, and gone off the taxi and the and the bus being complete frame up. Um, also frame up was the arrest at the uh, Texas Theatre where he was frisked as he must have been either in the theatre or you know especially as he's supposed to have had a, a, a his shooter mm. which is um, um, but when he was when he was when he was put up at four o'clock in the um, in the Dallas Police Department, arrested around about two o'clock, say, and, and then um, it, it was going to be put in a lineup at four o'clock, and he was frisked again, and that's when they found supposedly. Uh, a fistful of shells in his pocket, which you know, and, and it's just, uh, yeah. and it's a very, it should still be there. On, on the thing, it's worth listening to. Difficult sounds a bit difficult to keep in. That actually reminds me. What I was going to say earlier about from Stuart's presentation about the bullets that actually they found in Sir Hans' car with wood on them that match the. Um, the door frame. The, well, I don't know about the matching the door frame, but it was a bit suspicious that the only bullets that they were able to match to have been fired from Sir Hans Gutton well, just happened to be lying in his in his car mm -hmm. with wood on. So how have they dug them out? Are they the bu actual bullets that they dug out of the, yeah, the door the frame? six evidence with Sir Hans is just complete. Again, it's just complete. So he thinks it was a bit short. So <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, Bill Kelly's work, he is the expert on this, so I can't really share anything that he hasn't well, already yeah, done. Yeah, I dare say, he, but I mean, he, he's asked so I just... Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. And, and I guess if you want, want uh, give us your email, yeah, email yeah. address and I'll send it to Bill and I'll plug it off. Yeah, we'll do that. This stuff's very good. It's fantastic. Yeah, he's got even on, 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 on everything. I'm not, yeah, he's good. Yes, he's very good. good. But well, well with it, it, A lot of his, I remember reading a lot of his stuff, like education forum, like yeah, well, well, ten years ago, or longer. yeah, yeah, and he's he's quite reasonable. He's not somebody no, that, no, he's not that starts throwing no, no, elbows no, no, and things no, like that. No, he's all right. He's yeah. all right. So yeah. How long after the assassination did uh, Marina marry that guy from Paul? It was about. It was pretty soon. I, I got him. I thought it might have been years in the seventies, but no, no, no it was shortly. Yeah, yeah, it was about eight, eighteen months ago. No. But I ought to preface this thing. One, one thing I was going to include. Bearing in mind they're very young, and um, that um, when they're very young, an hour seems a long time. Mm. She genuinely says, and they question her on it. We had to wait a whole ten days before we could get married, <laughs> and she wasn't saying that with any. Thing. That's that is the mindset of what you're like when you're 19. So the fact that she got married, I did the same thing. I went and married the guy who got out of the Marines, you know. <laughs> so I went along with it. So the fact that she got married, he met. He was riding along on a horse when she met him, and it was about 18 months afterwards. And then they got divorced, right. and they lived together ever since. Of course, party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got That's divorced. Did they? Yeah. Was they it a white horse? <laughs> Sorry. Was it a white horse? Was he wearing a helmet? Uh, well, he was wearing a um, Stetson, I think, and he came anyway. Came so close enough. <laughs> yeah. Oh my and, God. Um, and um, yeah. So they had massive arguments. She was very <laughs> violent. And the judge said, said she was done for, um, uh, and he's a big guy, aggression against the husband. And the, the judge suggested they ought to get a divorce. They did get a divorce, and then they lived together and still still live together. So. Hmm. Life is strange. This is Mary Oswald's case. Mm. Talking about horses, um, 
Sahan Sahan was supposed to be oh, by yeah, the horse. The horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I love the horse thing. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's something in the horse side? I mean, he, I he, was, he seemed to still be involved with it, despite this accident and the fact that he'd given up mining and he could but, no longer be a This is why I was so disappointed by Lisa Peace's book, because I thought it was going to be... Oh, get the horse thing. Well, I, it, it, she, it focused on, I thought, the wrong things oh. and, and too much detail. I was expecting something much more along the lines that Melanson had written a long time <coughs> earlier and I wanted to read something that had sort of was an up, was an overview and was then an update of the things yeah, that have happened yeah, since yeah. Melanson, Melanson's book. I don't know if the one that you mentioned from last from uh, last year or the year before, uh, yeah, it, yeah. Totally, that does yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, but there is a book, John Hunt, who died recently, that's I've, I've seen various places online mentioned that he was working on something quite vast. That's more. That's quite technical in terms of the brain injuries to Bobby and all this kind of thing, <coughs> and that's supposed to be coming out. I don't have a title, but look out for that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. In terms of Collins, I think there's something there. It was a CIA fund. Well, he was that. Yeah, that it was. It was. It was it was a, yeah, it was. So they used to create these companies just yeah, to uh, agency for international development. Yeah. All of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to mention some of that because that comes up and it affected me. And by the way, I've got an elephant and a mysterious cat and all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. I haven't got a horse yet. Get the sure horse, yeah, Andrew. <laughs> 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 cool. Actually, can I just follow up on radio? It's something I read the other day whilst doing this. Um, was that Oswald, I've never looked at it, he wrote all this story about his life in unbelievable detail and he goes on about how many radios were stocked um, in Minsk um, and they were from the American exhibition. They've then gone to the Mexican exhibition, I forgot to mention that one. Um, Khrushchev was so angry at their poor quality that he deemed that they should never be seen again. Hence, I then started putting together, oh shit, they actually took them back to the factory. And I can't remember, it does say how many of them were stacked there. So they were considered incredibly poor quality, so the, much so the Russian that, that, that particular one they were doing in his, his factory. Yes, and yes. also at that time, um, there was, they, they were suffering, uh, the reason they had to hide them was there was such surplus because nobody wanted them, the price, of, even the Russians didn't want them because TVs were coming in, hence why they were stacked. So the fact, then you have to ask yourself, the fact they've sent him to this factory that is basically producing stuff nobody wants, but they're having to pay him because it's Russia. I can remember when I went to a conference in the USSR in 1985, uh, in your hotel room, there was a notice that said, be sure to unplug the TV set at night before you go to bed. <laughs> it was in several languages. Because they tend to catch fire. <laughs> Even if they're off. Yeah, but the hi-fi industry now, uh, and there's still some, like the old, um, who was it, used to produce the Val Lampagas. Um, um, right? um, Marshall? Maybe? No, there's some famous, well, when I was a youngster, and they all valves in those days, but the only people supplying the industry now are the Russians. Oh, well, yeah. Buy, yeah. Well, why why have they been forward? That's, well, that's China. <laughs> the, uh, Sorry, which industry? Uh, the valve industry. Oh, valve. Yeah, valve. yeah. 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 Well, you, you know, unless you have an antique piece of well, A lot of people in hi fi still use valve yeah. amplifiers. Yeah, yeah. 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 they're Class A yeah. amplifiers. Exactly, yeah. 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 we have several in our house. I wish we'd sell them. Vinyls come all the way back as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. My husband was going to throw one of the amps away, looked online. Yeah, I'm buying guns. It was about 1,600 quid. Sell it, I said. I'm <laughs> getting palpitations about bloody treason again. Which oh. I gave away at the library. Oh, that's oh fantastic. No. <laughs> That is, that's I've got joke. two two copies, oh, and I gave one away. The last one was worth a fortune. Now. Fortune. I know. I paid a hundred dollars. Well, more than that. I think I paid three yeah. quid for mine. How much? It was from one of my first books. I, I paid was just a hundred. Twyman. Was it? Yeah, John yeah, Twyman. Yeah. yeah. You know, good good door stuff. Isn't it? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Not, not as good as reclaiming history for keeping the dark. No. <laughs> 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 Excuse me, Julio is the only. 